Everybody, I have a, a, a surprise for you today. I've got one of my favorite musicians on the planet um, with me on the on a project we're working on. And I just wanted you to meet him because I think his life is one of the more interesting of any of the cats that I've known. And uh, so here he is, Luis Conte. Hey. <laughs> hey, man, how you doing? Hey, good, man. Leland. Well, first, I want to say I'm honored to be here with, with you, man, because... Uh, I'm a big fan of yours, always been, and we worked together so many times. Yeah, it's just great. So I'm honored that you asked me to do this. Well, so well, I, the thing I find so interesting about you is, you know, like so many of the guys I knew, you know, grew up in different parts of you know the country or different parts of LA, and uh, and they've all ended up at this gig. But your journey getting here is like to me far more. It's deeper and more amazing than most of the cats. And when I've heard you talk about it in the past, I just, I'm really taken aback by it because you've really had quite a journey here. So I just thought it'd be fun to, to share it with everybody. Sure, man. Well, the story goes, you know, as you know, I was born in Cuba and I was born in, San, I'm from Santiago de Cuba, which is the second biggest city in, in Cuba. If you see Havana, it's, we're in the Southeast, kind of North of Jamaica. And uh, so I grew up there. And around the age of 14, my father was a doctor. My father loved music. He played instruments. If he didn't practice, he would be dealing with music. He had friends that were musicians, et cetera, et cetera. So I grew up around this whole situation of the, tru the Cuban troubadours mm. in Oriente, Cuba, the singers, guitar, the guitar players. And uh, it was just music was all around all the time in my existence while I was there as a kid, man. On top of that, one thing that I, I think I never told you, Leland, is like my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, lived in Havana. And she would come visit us on a bus, take a whole day trip down here and stay with us for a couple of months. Oh, and, wow. And then go back to Havana again. Whenever she would come, she would bring me an instrument. Because since I was a little boy, I was beating on things. And she said, this kid, this kid loves music. This kid loves to play. So she'd bring me a guido. Mm. She'd bring me a pair of maracas, claves. I had all these things. It was all my, from my grandma. How cool. That's yeah. wonderful. And I would like sit next to the radio, because the radio was on all the time in my house with music on. And I would just jam next to the radio. That's how I started out playing. And I'm around in Cuba, and then suddenly, it must have been 64 or something like that, I hear about these four guys named the Beatles. <laughs> and that just turned everything around for me, you know. Um, Cuba, back in the day, well, the embargo and the whole deal, you know, we were all closed up, so we couldn't get any information. Actually, the first time I heard of the Beatles was a friend of mine that had a friend that had left with his family to the United States, sent him a bumblegum card in a letter and says, hey, this is what's happening out here. We had no idea wow. what was happening. Yeah. So anyway, I grew up listening to Cuban music and I grew up listening to pop and, and the Beatles and all pop American music. My dad had a radio, a portable radio he had bought. He let me use it, and he would get some kind of, I, would, I could get this one station, I've never known what it was, that played pop music. Mm. I was the luckiest guy in the world. And this, this station from, could have been from Jamaica. Yeah. Probably, not from the States. It was just, I would listen to everything that was going on in the States at the time, while being in Cuba all closed up, and listening to Cuban music, and Santeria players playing real, authentic shit, you know, so I'm, I'm like... Because yesterday you were talking about, like, the, the Buena Vista club coming to, you know, the guys who were at the house playing. Right. And stuff. Yes. That's but, so deep. Like I said, because my dad knew, the, knew all these guys. My yeah. dad was friends with another singer named Pacho Alonso that you never heard. He was, like, a huge star in Cuba. He was just friends with all these guys. And, and we lived, basically, there's a place in Santiago called Casa del, del Trubador, which is the house of the troubadour. Mm -hmm. And... Way back when I was a kid, this place, for some reason, all these guys would always go there. They'd be jamming all that the time. That was the hang. Huh? That was the, the hang. hang. Yeah, yeah, the hang. So, guys there were like, if you heard of this West of Buena Vista Social Club, Ibrahim Ferrer, Compay Segundo, the lead singers, those guys were all, they were from Santiago. They would hang out there. 
friends of my dad. Oh, today's your anniversary? Great. They go over to my house, bring the guitars. Here we go. There's a party in my house with my mom. And that's the way I grew up. So I would like, oh, they're playing. So I grab a set of claves and pick, 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 along with these guys. That's my upbringing. Man, that's a deep education, though, yeah. to be around those people. Yeah, man. And on the other side of that, I was, I bought a guitar. My dad got me a guitar. I'm learning Beatles songs. I'm listening to Aretha Franklin, you know. Um, my dad played, um, loved big man music. He had, you know, Tommy Dorsey and Glenn Miller records, stuff that he could get, you know, before 1959, because Cuba closed up. All those old records. My sister, I remember my sister... Having a, a uh, the forty five of Hound Dog, wow. of the, and she played that over and over and over, and then she got a record of Doris Day, Pillow Talk, and I would like I learned the whole record, I would just listen to it. I liked the language, you know, mm -hmm. it was just craziness, man. So like that, now I'm now fourteen years old, and. The government of Cuba, the president Castro says, from the age of 15, you're in the military. Nobody leaves the island. Nobody's leaving the island, period. So my dad went, I gotta get this kid out of here, man. He's never gonna get out of here. Yeah. So long story short, he got me, I was able to get out of Cuba. And when I left, I left legally on a flight from LA to uh, Spain. I, there were two freedom flights, I think a month or every couple of months. One was to Spain and one was to Mexico. And I was just lucky enough, I got the one to Spain. So I ended up going to Spain. I was taken care of there by a ref, in a refuge by some Jesuits. I was there for four months. And I got finally got my visa and all that. And my sponsor was a third cousin of my dad, who I never knew. His name was actually... He's passed away now. His name was Luis Conte also. Oh, how crazy yeah. is that? Gee. Yeah. And where did he live? He lived in Hollywood, man. He lived on La Mirada, 6443 La Mirada. Like, uh, it's basically found on Wilcox. Yeah. It's right at the center of Hollywood. So I come from Cuba, from this whole world of Cuban music and all this stuff and, and rock and roll that I'm hearing on the radio. And now I'm here. And I'm walking, that story I told you about, the, we were living in rationing cars in Cuba. And the, uh, the wife of Luis, Lola, she said to me, hey, listen, if you want, it must have been a weekend, because it says, you know, Monday we're going to sign you up and you can take you to your school and sign you up. So if you want, you know, walk out the door, go make a ride, you'll see a big street, that's sunset, make a left, you go a few blocks, and you see this big building. That's your school. So take a walk. So now, now you had said, explain what the ration cards were in, in Cuba. Yeah, we had rationing cards. I mean, I, my dad had this card. So we had to buy milk, eggs, shoes, clothing, anything. It's all ration. It's all by this card. So you, I guess you'd go to the store. I mean, I was a kid, so I don't know. But yeah. you go to the store and says, oh, no, you can't. Your son needs a... Uh, Tennis shoes for basque for PE. Well, he already got shoes six months ago, so you're only allowed a pair of shoes for a year. So mm. you're screwed. You know, it's, it was yeah. horrible. Yeah. And worse than that, it was like the food, you know, milk and things. My, my grandmother was old. She needed certain things. It was, it was pretty hard. So I'm out here, and, she, and Lola tells me, go take a walk. And, man, I get to the corner of Sunset. I make a left, like she says, and some car just pulls up. And out of the car, in the back of the car, these two girls walk out, these hippies with bell-bottom pants, no shoes, no bras, you know, a little tank top and shit, just, and I'm going, you can't get shoes here either? <laughs> I mean, what the, what the hell? You know, shock, This man. is America? Yeah, what this is, is America. Why did I leave? Wait a second. <laughs> Where's my rationing card? You know. <laughs> That's great. It was shocking, yeah. But, you know, so I... Just grew up here, man. I went to Hollywood High School. And I started, I'm a really late comer in music. I, I wasn't sure what I, was, what I was gonna do. One thing you must, you have to think about, being 15, it was like for my, in my life, it was like turning off the lights. So like you're living one life right now yeah. and you're gone. 
and you're in a whole other life, you can't even speak, call, see, talk to, and communicate with your parents. I have no communication. I can't imagine. I just can't imagine. Yeah, I didn't talk to my mom and dad until I was 22. Jesus. And I left when I was, you know, almost 15. Wow. All I had was letters that would come late. You know, I would write my parents um, every month. Every month I would write my parents. And I would get a letter saying, we haven't heard from you in like months. Yeah. Uh because -huh. letters would... You they know, weren't delivering them. They weren't delivering them. Would they censor? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They would read things and, you know, the, yeah. and, and stuff like that. So it was pretty hard, man. But, you know, I made it through high school. And then I just, music is, got, kept me out. I bought a guitar, you know, I had a little job bagging groceries at the Hollywood Ranch Market. God, I love the Ranch Market. Yeah, I grew up there, man. That's, I worked at the Hollywood Ranch Market it, boxing groceries. Ed Sullivan, I mean, uh, Steve Allen Theater was right next door. We used to go there when I was in, in high school because they would bring the camera out onto the street. And like the man on the yeah. street moments. And we would be out there going crazy and shit so the camera would see us and yeah, stuff. Man. And then we'd go in the ranch market. Some guy like laying in the produce on a hot night and stuff. It was crazy, That man. was great. I, yeah. I didn't know you had worked there. That's bitch. Yeah. Man. I lived three blocks away. And, and I uh, I would go get the groceries. And I was I had just turned 16. I remember the manager. I was They were really busy. So I, I went and helped. And I started putting, putting the groceries in the bag. And the, this guy comes over and goes, hey, you want a job? I go, yeah. I started working there. That's great. <laughs> Bags and groceries. Yeah, man, Hollywood. The Hollywood Ranch Market. Wow. Oh, wow. So I grew up, it was all Hollywood right there. Uh, actually, I was going to ask you, because I remember you were probably one of those guys. I would walk from Hollywood High down Sunset to Cherokee, mm -hmm. down Sunset Sound. Yeah. We, we work a lot now. But those days, you were already doing sessions yeah. while I was in high school. And you were probably one, of, I would like walk by there and I would hear commotion and there was people out in the parking lot or things going, you're probably one of them guys out probably there. Probably was. Yeah. Because we were there all the time, especially Sunset Sound. Right. You know, because you had, because right on the street, the front of that place, right behind it, is where the basketball court and all that is. So you can hear everything going on where like a Cherokee and those, everything's in the building. Right. Where there you could hear cats hanging out and in the parking lot right. and stuff. So I would, I would walk. I would go to chair, to that street because I would make a right, and that's where I would hear the com stuff that's going on. Yeah. I wonder what's going on in there. Because right behind that, if you go one more block south, that's a, there's a park right there, Cherokee yeah. Park. And I used to go hang out in there. And, you know, so then, so I just kept going, and then all of a sudden, man, I discovered that I, as soon as I was 18, I, I left home, that the, the place I was staying, and I got my apartment, and living with a couple other guys, roommates and stuff like that, and I realized I can make 50 bucks in the bungalows instead of like banging some groceries or, I think I'm gonna do that. That's yeah. basically how it went down. You know, and I started, so I started, I knew it all, you know, as far as the Afro-Cuban thing. Yeah. Because I grew up in it and I was doing it. And I was around all those guys, not even, not doing it with them, but I was around it. Yeah. I, it was in here. And I just came, it all came out. It's crazy. It's like a perfect storm when that yeah. stuff happens, yeah. Yeah, and then, you know, and then the other side of that, my love of American music and rock and roll, I love all, all of it. I love it all. So I'm playing a little guitar, you know, it became like a whole thing. Yeah, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to play some music, you know. So I started like we all do, you know, yeah. you meet this guy, you meet that guy, you know, I don't have the same story as most of you guys that you say, oh yeah, I was in a high school band, my band, you know, I was, my high school days, basically I was sort of lost. I had no parents. I was living with my cousin, very nice, very cool people, very thankful that I was living with them, but it wasn't really my family. I was just all yeah. alone, man. So I was, it was difficult. So I said, I left, then I found my spot and it's like, okay, it's music. But now I'm now like 18, you know. And my first road gig, I, uh, I, I started finding out what's, where do you go? What do you do? So I, and I heard, oh, there's a musician's union. Mm -hmm. I know nothing about music. I was in the uh, retail clerk's union because I bag groceries. So I figured <laughs> if there's a union, I'll go there and get a gig. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, guess what, man? 
I had uh, met a, some good people before, and I the day I end up going to the union to see what's happening at the union, see if I can, if this, I sign up and get a job. I run into this guy who I had met before, and he says, hey, Luis, there was just a couple of people here that were looking for somebody to play percussion. They're, they're going, they, they have a record, some, a single out or something like that, they're going to New York. Really? Yeah, I got, where are they? Says, I don't know, but they, they just left, but I have their number. You want to come? I go to a pay phone. It was, long story short, it was the Hughes Corporation. Oh, wow. It was a rock the boat, don't rock yeah. the boat. But them guys. So I called them up. I, I didn't even have a car, man. I called a friend of mine. I, I had a motorcycle. A friend of mine says, man, can you give me a ride with my congas <laughs> to go down to South Central and re audition? And, and that was my first gig, like That's traveling. That's cool. So I got to see, man, I got to experience, you know, uh, Don Kirshner in concert, the Midnight Special, ABC in concert, all of, uh, Soul Train, all those shows. I did all those shows. I saw a lot of the R&B bands that I loved, the Spinners, the OJs. Uh, yeah. I remember, man, I remember going to uh, the first trip that we did. It was a promotional tour by RCA. So we, we played in Newark, New Jersey, Cherry Hill, New York, the Latin Casino. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, I forget where else, somewhere in, somewhere in Philly or somewhere. Oh, Washington, D.C. And the very first gig, we got right from the upper, we went right to Soundcheck. And I'm walking in the, I walk in the back, and I hear, I went, what is that? Yeah. I mean, that was... That was a, a game changer for everybody. No shit, man. Yeah. And it was the OJs, sounds checking before us. You know, we're the opening act. Yeah. So, I mean, so I I go from, like, Hollywood to, like, okay, I'm going to play music to, like, I'm in this world. I'm in the middle of everything. It was fantastic, man. Yeah. Fantastic. And, you know, just one things, you know, started rolling. You know how, how the music thing is. You meet guys and you keep, you know, hear from this guy, the other guy call you. And I end up getting whatever. Then I went, yeah, I, after the Hughes Corporation, then I went back home and I just started working around L.A. And I started playing with this Latin band. And it's the first time I was in a studio. And we recorded this song. And they needed maracas, and they needed clavis, and they needed a cowbell, I guess, for stuff. And I said, well, you know, you, you can put that. I can, oh, you mean I play this and I can put that on top of that? Yeah. So I was, when I did that, I was fascinated with studio work. Mm -hmm. I just thought the studio was... It's an amazing place, isn't it? It's an it? amazing thing, you know. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, so, and you're one of the greatest, man. So, you know, I mean, I... When I saw that, I said, well, I really like love to do that, too, you know. But that's the thing, you know, there's a happy medium in there, because you can do a lot of studio, and then you go like, man, I got to go play some live music. Yeah. And then you do a lot of that, and you go, oh, I think I want to go back home. <laughs> yeah, we've been, you know, I mean, like, I feel like you, I mean, been really lucky to be able to balance these things. Yeah. You know, not have to make a decision about one or the other, because they, they both satisfy a completely different part of you. The thing I love is, like, when I'm, on the road, I play a note. Note's done. The yeah. audience heard it, it's done. Get in the studio, they can dick with that note for a month. That's right. And, and so I, I love having that, but I love making a record. Yeah. So it's, it's you know, it's all these, these two different worlds that two we get complete. to travel in. And, and you're right that we've been able to balance it, you know, because some guys haven't done that. Yeah. You know? I always like, after a while, you know, yeah, I'll do that tour. I gotta get out there and play. Yeah, and you want and want to be in the world. Yeah, you get out of town, man. Got, exactly. Yeah. All about you. The next thing you know, you're just here. Yeah. You know, and uh, I mean, it's it's been great. I can't complain. Yeah. You know, so we played. You know, I started working with a bunch of different people, and then we've worked together with Phil. Yeah. Phil Collins and Madonna. And I worked with Madonna and a bunch of other acts. I mean the. The first big, big, big tour I did was real big, like Private Jet and the whole bit was the Madonna stuff. You know? Yeah. We did like three years of that. But no, I've just been... Doing then you've been thing, doing man. James. I've been James Taylor for yeah. about 20 years now. Yeah, it's great. The first time I did it was, well, when 
our brother Carlos passed. Yeah. And then James asked me, hey, you want to come play some percussion? So it's so like back in 98. Yeah. I started playing with him. So on and off. I haven't played with him for a couple of years now because of the pandemic thing. And Yeah. But hopefully next year we're going to do a little bit. With James, Jackson Brown, all these guys, man, you play with. Yeah. You know. You know we've traveled a lot of the, I mean, between road and, and studio, we've done so much together over the years. And to me, it's like every time I walk in, I see your stuff in the room, I go, yeah, this going to be good. Because <laughs> it's just fun, you know. I mean, yeah. we always have a good time and... And, and I always enjoy, you know, w when we're doing this stuff, just the colors and textures and stuff that percussion brings to things. It's just this, this other dimension. It's a whole other thing, yeah. And, and it's, just, it's just great to, you know, see the bags of toys that get brought out. Yeah. This stuff. Yeah, that's, that's the thing with me, you know, uh, coming from Cuba, your, or, your original instruments, the first, your first instruments, Drumming wise, are the conga drums, the bongo drums, and the guido, the maracas, and the clave. But then I remember, well, I'm out here. This, then you see the world. So yeah. you come out here, you're in the world. And I see this guy named Ayrton, one of the greatest. Yeah. yeah I, but I don't know who this guy is, but I'm, I'm watching this. I go to this show, and it's like, this guy stands up, he's got a tambourine that it looks like a tambourine that is not. It's actually a pandeiro, Brazilian pandeiro. And he just starts wailing on this thing. It's an orchestra. Uh, yeah. yeah. So being out here, my, my thing, I just started, I'm a sponge, man. Just get yeah. that, you know. And a guy playing a tabla, oh, what is that? Yeah. You know. When know. you're around cats like Emil, and the, yeah. you know, and you just, this guy just pulls out like his water gongs and all this. You just go, what's that? Exactly. You man. know, just mind-blowing. I There was a project I did uh, on Pablo Records. With Walfredo, that was Reyes Sr., oh, and wow. Louis Belson. It was a combination. It's, the record is a collector's item. It's called Ecue, E C U E, on Pablo, if you can find it. And it's like Amo Richards is there. You know, it was all percussion, all drums and percussion. And we had to go to Amo's uh, warehouse to pick up some stuff. And when I went in, it's like, huh? Yeah. His warehouse was unbelievable. Yeah, man. he of all everybody, he amassed. He had I mean, he would like work half a year and then take the other half of the year and travel the world yeah. and collect instruments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, he was amazing to me. I, one of the neatest times I spent with him, and it was a tragic time, was the day before Chuck DeMonico passed away. Mm. He went up to Chuck's house, and it was Emil and and Joe Picaro and me. Oh, and we wow. sat with with, with, with Chuck? him and Chuck Whoa, just wow. talking. They brought up cold cuts, and we made sandwiches and sat out in the backyard and stuff. And such beautiful cats, man! Oh, Those the best! Just, and Emil and Joe was gone too. Yeah, and, and Chuck and you, those guys. You, you just treasure every, all these relationships because you know, even when cats live old. I mean, we've been around it a long time now, so you know, it's you know, you start to see the cats going away. And uh, they're, all you get. they're irreplaceable. Yeah, they're all see. unique. Everybody starts going. I know, man. And Emil, you know, those guys are so real. Larry Bunkers, I know. Yeah. You know, those, I got a Larry Bunker story. I, I, uh, I, did a, I was at a movie date and had just done my second album, which we did actually in the back room over there, Black Forest. I was going to work with Larry Bunker. I got to give him my record, man. I'm, yeah. I look up to this guy. Hey, Larry, if, if you don't mind, you know, I would like to... Oh, yeah, well, thank you, Luis, you know. I figured, you know, he's not going to... Yeah. If he listens to it, it'll be uh, some time, you know. Dude, that night, I get a call, and he goes, Hey, Luis, you know, this <laughs> uh, How you doing? Listen, I just listened to your album, man. I, I, I really love, really great, you know. It's a, really giving me nice compliments. And then he goes, But now, I got a question for you. On site, on the track two, uh, so-and-so, those team ballers you're playing, those are not LP team ballers, are they? Wow. I you right. I said, you're right, man. I says, yeah, are those like some, those some others, those, those, are those Lidis? I go, and if you know anything about team ballers, they're these classic old Lidi Lowick team ballers made in the 40s. I have a set. And that's what's on my record. Wow. He could hear it. I mean, those cats. Ears, ears. There's some ears, man. I went, my God, man. Yeah, man. yeah you're right, bro. And then Amo, I was on another movie date, and and I measured, man, I got to work on this thing, and I need this kind of sound. 
I went home and then Emil calls me up and goes, hey, I was just thinking about what you were talking about. He says, go to, go to Ben and Bath and Beyond and buy some salad bowls and put them upside down and get some mallets and hit them. You know, just yes, beautiful weird. guys, man. Yeah. Yeah, Gary Coleman. There was a whole bunch of oh, those yeah. cats that were just... I always love man, because when, you know, records is one thing, but when you're doing movie dates and you look back at the percussion section, there might be four or five cats back there. And then you really get a feel for what it, what it's all about, because one cat's over on timpanis and oh, somebody yeah. else is playing vibes or marimba or something like that. Yeah. And I just go, man, this is it's like the fun section. It's like a playground back yeah. there. And they're all kids. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is that the attitude, you look at the string players and they're all like real, they're looking at oh, yachting, yachting <laughs> magazines and shit like that. And the horn sections over there talking about who was drunker and who got laid and all that. <laughs> and you and you look back there and these guys are just playing with toys and then the rhythm section's just jamming, incessantly driving everybody crazy. Yeah. I mean, the psychology of the orchestra is fantastic, but yeah. I always love going back and hanging with the cats back there. Oh, yeah, man. like just deep. It's always something to do, always something yeah. to find, and so many things, you know. That's, yeah. that's the beauty of percussion. I love the variety. And, and you, all, you have to be a little bit like a historian or, or what's the right word, like a, a, a student of the world. Mm -hmm. Because every place has a thing, yeah. a, a, an instrument, and a, and a style. And if you're a studio guy... You, you you can be called up and they'll, they'll might say, you know, can you do something like, and you got to pull out something that's really of, of that flavor. Right. And uh, it, it's like I, I did a project. Hi, everybody. Um, I did a project and, and they had Jack Ashford oh, come in and do it, you know, and he pulls out this box of tambourines and, I, and he starts dancing. That with that thing, you know, and, yeah. and dude's like six five or something. Yeah. He's a huge cat. Yeah, I've never met him. Man, oh, man, he was, he, I was working with, um, it was Eddie Mitchell, the French oh, well, Yeah, singer. yeah, Eddie yeah, Mitchell. And it was Cropper and, and um, uh, Booker was on it, and they, and they had him, and we were doing all these tunes like that, and just... You know, just, you know, you, you see people playing a tambourine, and it's kind of like, you know, a, a dime store thing, and then you see a guy play tambourine and that's go, the deal holy crap you know it's like a stradivarius yeah. in there all of yeah. a sudden yeah and uh, and that's the thing i appreciate so much is like you know when when i look back and i or like when we were out on phil collins's tour and i'd look over at all of your the, the toys up yeah. there you know which, which aren't toys i mean they're musical instruments but there's this thing and they need to pull out just like a a, like a, a strand of shells or something like that and the sound that that makes as compared to something that's a little bit you know tighter sounding and each one has its own vibe and then it's really the musician who just makes those things be what they are because in somebody else's hands they could be crap that's right that's so. right well james one thing i love about james when he introduces me james always says and you know this guy over here he hits things and makes music yeah you know, which is basically what it is, but you have to know what to hit and how to, you know. Well, it's that. better better that than what I went through with him when he introduced me and say, Here's, he has the personality of a urinal cake. Oh! Oh, my. <laughs> or the man behind the Shroud of Turin. Oh! <laughs> he said that? Yeah. Oh, he's crazy. He used to give me all kinds of shit. Oh, my God. But I, I love the idea of hitting things and making me, because yeah. it's really true. It's true. You know, be, be percussionists, drummers, you know. You're just you're hitting an inanimate object, but it's become it's becomes music. It becomes music. Yeah, that's right. And it's the first instruments. I mean, before there was anything else, people were hitting logs and yeah. whatever, and, and creating rhythm. And that's well, the first thing was what word and and word and and rhythm. And, yeah, and drums. You know. And now we've got rap, which is kind of I mean, it's, it's like kind the of, circle yeah. that's traveled is really. Sort of, Kind of like that. I mean, right. you look back to beatnik times when it was bongo drums and 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 somebody doing poetry. Exactly. Yeah. So you know, we don't then haven't gotten too far from the <coughs> from the source at this point. It's still it's still that. Yeah. But man, you know the thing I was gonna I just remember something, you know, because people say, "Oh man, would you play like this? You play nice, this and that." I said, but it wasn't. I didn't know what to do until I did it. Because I'm just like kind of self-taught, right? Yeah. So my first recording session ever, which I actually, my first recording session, 
was the one that I talked about that I do in the overdose. Yeah. But when I actually get an actual call, my first call that somebody recommended me, the producer, I was playing the comment rooms, and they go, and I played. And he went, yeah, can you play simpler? And I played a little simpler. He says, yeah, I think we need a little more simpler. And I'm playing the simplest beat that you can play on the comment on the comment, which is a, just this tumbao thing that we call tumba. Well, it's simpler, you know. Anyway, I kind of stepped all over. I have no idea what these guys were talking about. I'm not sure if they knew what they were talking about yeah. or what I was talking But I was so green. I went in there. They were real nice. They gave me, wrote me a check for 100 bucks. I said, okay, thank you. Got it. And I was, as I was leaving, a friend of mine that played percussion, I saw him driving in to the parking lot. He was coming in. They had called him. They got rid of me. So my very first session, I like sucked. <laughs> so you. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, I got sent home, man. So I learned. I was like, what happened? What? I I know that was some. Something wasn't working. Yeah, I had the vibe. That I don't think yeah. I did good, you know. So I kind of like I don't know. I just taught myself to like fit in and and what does it mean you're not too busy or what is? I never thought about time. Like you don't. Yeah. You rush or you don't rush or whatever. You know, it's, just, it's just what I do, you know. Yeah. And then I just started getting, just learning, watching guys. Because there's an etiquette, there's a whole world. When you're in the studio, it's another world. I mean, when we started, when James hit and we did the Troubadour, and all of a sudden he was on the cover of Time magazine, and we were getting, I went from never having been in the studio except once to do a demo with the band I was in, to being a, a first call player and not knowing what a DI was, how to plug in, how to do anything. And you're sitting there and people are looking at you like you're, you're Carol Kay or you're right. you know, James Jamerson. And you're going, man, I'm, I'd be lucky if I was Ralph Cramden at this <laughs> point. <laughs> I'm brand new, man. Yeah, I mean, I really had no clue what was going on. And it was really intimidating and scaring, but you didn't want them to know that right. you didn't know what the hell was going on. Yeah. So you're like just trying to be... I'm cool. I got it. You know, yeah. you know. and, and I had experiences. Uh, just remember another thing. And then I go somewhere else and I had one cowbell. I know that's funny. The joke of the cowbell, right? But I had yeah. one cowbell. And, but I, this producer goes, hey, you have a lower one? And I went, uh, no. It's, so I, I went, oh, I guess just not one. You know, if I'm Different playing live, things. this is the bell. That's cool. But yeah. now we're in the studio. Oh, I guess I have to have a few different ones because yeah. we don't... Oh, that's how that works. It's a real learning curve. Yeah, I was learning by, you know... Yeah. Well, I remember range. talking to Hal Blaine about that, and he he was telling me that when he got started, um, somebody said, you know, can you, you can play percussion too, can't you, besides drums? And he went, yeah, of course, having never done it yeah. before. But he said, man, if I would have said no, they would have hired somebody else... So he said, I immediately went on, talked to a couple of guys, figured out what I might need to have there, yeah, and then figured it out. Because he said, I didn't never wanted to say no to anybody. Right. So you just you make it work. You just go there and you make it work. Yeah. And then you learn. And you're, oh, yeah. You know. Yeah. So. And each session's a learning experience. So you get to the next date, and they, they if something like that comes up again, you go, I got it. Yeah, right. I'm good. You know? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All like that, bro. Man, we still get to do this, and we're here today making great music. We're still doing it. Yeah. That's... Uh, I love it. What a blessing, man. I love it, man. Well, thank you, man, for for sitting down and doing this. This is really great, because we never really gotten a chance to to do this, even like out on the road. You know? Yeah, like we never. We're like passing ships out there. It's like your world just <laughs> turns into this other thing, looking for a good sandwich or something. Like that. I, do you remember me? If I, I saw you... Uh, I was on my friend's, I was in the back of my friend's motorcycle in Paris. Yeah. Do you remember that? And like, we're going, I said, well, yeah, let's go. Drive it down over, over to Notre Dame, man. Okay, so we, I don't know what this is going on. And now we'll go by that river and we're going to make a right. And there's Leela. You remember that? It was so weird. What's it? I said, I'm just waiting for Maureen. She's like, she was doing something. Yeah. <laughs> was so I mean, that's the thing that, that the craziest thing. I remember being in, in with Maureen in, in, we were in Paris we went out to dinner, and we went to this restaurant. We walked down a street to get to it, 
And when we were leaving, we started to walk back up that street. And I said, we've already been up that way. Let's go to the, let's go to the right. Let's go down that way. We walk by, we get, we walk by the next restaurant. I hear, Hey, and I look over, my parents are there. I had no idea they oh, were wow. on vacation and they were in the next restaurant having dinner. That's amazing. I mean, it's just the weirdest things yeah. that happen when you're on the road. The road. But the more you're on the road, the more these things happen. Because this is the world that we all live in. Is we're always in transit somewhere. And if you're not together, I remember I was with Tracy Chapman somewhere on the road. And I think Daryl and those guys were driving by in a van or something. And they looked out the window. It was probably back in the... No, it was like 97 or somewhere around that period. I think where you, you came on to Phil 97. 97. 97. Yeah, and I, I came back in 2000. Right. Um, but they said they were driving in a van. and I, It was somewhere in Europe. And they said, there's a Lee going down the street. And I was with Tracy Chapman over in Europe oh, wow. at that time. So it's just weird. You know, I mean, you, 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 I always kind of think, you know, I live in a big city in L.A., but there's so many times it feels like Mayberry. <laughs> You know, I mean, yeah. it's just like you're on the freeway, you look in the next car and you know the cat in the car. Yeah. Go, yeah. What? Yeah. Millions of people here. And we know a lot of people too. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. Also, you know. It's a it's, hell of a community. My kids laugh. I remember one, the very first, bucket, once they were big enough and they were walking and stuff like that, we'd go down to Clearwater. All my family is in Clearwater. So we'd travel to Clearwater and we have to change planes because it's from, no direct flight from here. And we're at the, at the airport, and I'm walking to the airport, and I said, hey, Luis, what's, hey, what's happening? David, what are you doing, man? This is... And then, hey, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. cats. And the airport's we... more than anything. Yeah. I always see cats you know walking yeah, to the now airport. We're, now we're changing planes in, in uh, Denver, and the same thing happens. Finally, my son was like, Dad, you know everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, it's crazy, isn't like, it? We just know people. I love it. I yeah. think, to me, it's, it's so fascinating, that this, the, the world that we, we travel in. Yeah. We're lucky. We are really we're lucky because man, I mean, I mean, we're driving like today, coming to the studio. You know, we we have to be in tra LA traffic and all this stuff. You know, we don't we're blessed. We don't have to we don't yeah. live with most people. Then they, you sit there and you look at the people and next to you on the freeway when you're stopped, and you go, they have to do this every, every day. day. Yeah, you know, maybe a couple once a month or a couple of times a month at the Fine. most. That's okay. Yeah. Or like, could we start at 11? Yeah. Yeah. Do you mind? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no problem. No, yeah, this is great. It's a different world. Yeah. Thank God, man. I don't know what I would have... I have no idea what I, what I would have ended up. If it's not for music, I have no idea. Yeah, I would have been happy to be a gardener. I always thought, you know, I like, wanted to be like a brick mason. I always, when I see somebody doing a beautiful block wall... I go, it would really be nice to, um, really, I mean, I can bullshit my way through a, putting up some stuff, but to really know how to yeah, yeah, yeah. do that stuff, I always, I had a great fondness. <laughs> well, I think we're being called back to work now, I guess the, uh, well, the salt mine calls. The fun is over. <laughs> Thanks, man. All it's, right, man. It's so great. I love this, man. We got years ahead of us. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank man. you, Leland. Okay, Luis. Bye-bye.